You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and this is a conversation that features a fellow called Blair Late. Blair is the bassist and vocalist in Brisbane-based A Breach of Silence. The reason for the conversation, they're at the tail end of the promotion of their excellent release from 2016, which is called Secrets, so we thought we'd have a chat about that. But as I want to do, we talked about a bunch of other things as well. So I hope you enjoy it. Here he is, Blair Late. But mate, uh, it's, I'm glad you're here, a Queenslander, mate. Actually, yeah, it's uh, it's not often I get to chat to a band from Brisbane, so that's a bit of a thrill. Oh, there you go. <laughs> you know, how, <laughs> to oblige. how did you hook up with Chris? Chris Poland at Eclipse. So um, it's a pretty funny story, actually. We um, we were it was it was back in 2012. We'd just finished making our album, our first debut album, and. Um, like we decided to do it properly. Like we, you know, went out on a whim and messaged Frederick Nordstrom from Sweden. And nice. just, yeah. He said he'd do it for us. Like, and we're just like, fuck, this, this is awesome. You know, like we're just doing a DIY. And he said, yeah, like we have no record label or anything, you know? And, um, we made this album and sort of produced it ourselves, uh, released it ourselves just through, um, like CD baby, you know, and stuff like that. Yep. Um, and, then we started uh, shipping it, like, or shopping it overseas, like, just. And anyway, long story short, we uh, sent a whole bunch of CDs to record labels, like physical copies, rather than just internet. You know, mm. um, this was, you know, I mean, nowadays you might do it online, but even back in 2012, we're like, no, we're going to send them CDs. So um, we sent like a couple of the major record labels, like. Um, CDs, but they were in a package with like our like a like a T-shirt, you know, oh, like sweet. a yeah. band merch, you know, hmm. just so it's a big package amongst all the little ones, you know. And um, we sent a few just CDs out. And anyway, in the ones that we were sending to the major labels and to you know um, the more indie indie ones like Eclipse Records and stuff like that, um, we were sending out packages that had babies' arms and legs in it, like dolls. <laughs> Sorry, I should have clarified <laughs> that uh, dolls arms and legs yep. um, in, it, in it and we'd attach a note to it saying like we'll give an arm or a leg if you'd sign us so okay yeah and like you know we thought oh, that's pretty cheesy you know like it's pretty uh gets your notice though yeah well that's um that's exactly right and anyway that um package fell across chris's desk um and it was during a time when i think um i, I don't don't quote me on this, but I, th- I think he was advertising at the time that he was signing new bands. Like he'd just released a few and was, was, it was just so happened that he was in like an intake period kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, our package was, you know, a, a standout amongst all the other CDs that came. And he basically went, Oh, this is cool. You know, like whatever, had a good little, have a good little chuckle. And then put this, like it, it basically made our album be the one that he puts in the CD player. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. Because he got like, you know, he always says, you know, he gets like hundreds and hundreds of submissions, you know, every week. So but this this one was able to stand out, you know. So I'm glad we did because otherwise we would have just put another number on his desk, you know. So it was it was cool. And then um, that, um, yeah, that's sort of the main, main story of how we got signed kind of thing. And then it's sort of been um, just really good work ethic with him mm-hmm. ever since, you know. He's, he's, he's a really cool dude to work with. Now, I don't know Chris that well. I've had a few email interactions and I've never actually spoken to him, but he seems like a really cool bloke, it's got to be said. And from what I understand about him, what you did is exactly what he's looking for. He's looking for a band that can stand on their own two feet and just need someone to help them give them a bit of a profile, which he can help do. Yeah, so, that's yeah, he, yeah, he loves that do-it-yourself ethic. I mean, I, I remember being in bands back in the day and uh, – this is my story. I haven't shared this one actually with somebody. So 300 interviews deep and I haven't shared this story. So this is a good one. My mother taught Dennis Handlin's son. Who Dennis Handlin, of course, is the head of Sony Music Australia, was the head of Sony Music Australia for many years. Yeah, yeah. I was in a like a nobody band. We're rehearsing in a lounge room, like a shit band, you know, playing okay music, but not a good band, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. And the opportunity presented itself. So, of course, this is back in the days of four-track tape, so the 90s. Yeah. And I gave him the tape and nothing ever came of it. But I often think if I'd had my shit together back then, and I was probably old enough to have had my shit together back then, I was 19 or 20, because I certainly recognised the opportunity. But you won't get that sort of opportunity again, is my point, through this through that story. 
But what yeah, you yeah, but what you guys did, you you chanced your hand, and you've got somebody who's probably a really good fit for you as well. The other thing is, I probably wouldn't have been a good fit for Sony back then because I wouldn't. I would have signed a contract that would have locked me in for fifteen or sixteen years and eight albums and three hundred and sixty degree management. You know, the nineteen ninety seven or eight version of the three hundred and sixty degree management contracts that they've got going on these days, where you sign your life away and. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so maybe things happen for the best, but that's my story. There you go. <laughs> Excellent. No, that's it. Yeah, no, it's all right. So, so you, guys, you guys have a gig coming up at Crowbar, I understand, in August. We do, yeah. We're really excited about okay. it. We, um, we love playing Crowbar. It's like our sort of home away from home, you know. So it's, um, it's going to be a good show. We've got um, you know, King Mungie playing, um, Elephant, Dr. Parallax, like it's going to be sick. So King Mungie are like a band from the Gold Coast that um, broke up, I think, a while yeah, ago. Yeah, I remember them, mate, from the early 2000s when I was in a band called Blank Out. They were the band that you wanted to get on a show with. Exactly. They're, um, yeah, mm. They had a really good following back then. And it's um, this gig has really sort of stirred a bit of interest because of them. So we're, um, we're cheering about that. So we're going to sort of have both of our fan base there and sort of make it a big, huge party. So you know, can't wait, man. It's going to be sick. From what I understand about their music now, they may have changed, but I certainly remember their music back in the day. Um, you, you're a really good fit for them based on what I'm hearing on your album, A Breach of Silence. So let's talk about the album, A Breach of Silence, okay? So I understand it was released in 2016, is that right? Um, the, yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, our latest one um, yeah. was released, uh, yeah, this sort of, yeah, I think it was December 2016. So it was sort of at the back end of the... Um, Album run, you know Cycled, what I mean? Well, yeah. Um, How's yeah, it? Part of the new one, so. So this is a good time to have a chat. So did it do for you what you thought, it, well, what you wanted it to do for you? Was it managed to achieve the audience that you hoped for? Um, the latest one, or sort of all three together, or oh, probably. Let's talk about a breach of silence because that's the one I've been listening to. Oh no, that's our latest album, Secrets, man. Is it? I c- yeah. No, sorry, secret. Sorry, my bad. I'm apologies. I'm, I'm reading on, on my sheet here. Sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, secret. Sorry. Is the, is the band's name is A Breach of Silence and That's the right, album yeah. is Secrets. There you go. Yeah. I got it right. There you go. <laughs> Get there eventually. Um, yeah, yeah. So so Secrets, we kind of had a bit of a different um, a different sound. Uh, we wanted to make it a bit more fresh. You know, we're like we've always said um, over our last sort of three albums, we're like we don't want to just make the same album again. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like some bands do, and that's cool. Like Slayer stick to their formula and they love it. Um, you know, if our album sounds the same between albums, then that's cool. It just means, you know, we've continued with the same creativity. But like we like to evolve with each one, you know, like take in the things we've learned over the, you know, previous couple of years. You know what I mean? So yeah. this one, we, uh, uh, Reese, our, you know, our screamer, our front man, he um, really stepped up to the plate a lot more in this album it's um it features him a lot more he he um there's songs on there like uh shameless which is the um cover of the weekend mm-hmm. and he um he nails it you know he, he does a really good job he's he's trained his voice to really sort of get that pitch screaming down pat and um yeah he's been using it to the best of his ability so it's, it changed the sound a lot more I, I i do think we headed in the right direction based on where we are at the moment. So, hmm. yeah, it's it's done well for us, man. Yeah, we're, we're really proud of it. And, and your role, mate, which is interesting to me because I'm also a bass player who sings a little bit, and that seems to be what you would, you do on the band. So can you describe your role in full, though? So obviously you're the band spokesperson as well. But talk about what you do with the band just outside of playing music. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like, I – well, I run the merch. Um, <laughs> uh uh, yeah, like, what do you mean? Like, what my other jobs yeah, are? Yeah, it's. In, I, in I like to. Thing. Yeah, I suppose one of the things that I like to do is really sort of lift the veil on the way bands operate. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And because I, I, listen, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and and obviously terrestrial. I don't listen to terrestrial radio anymore. But when I was listening to terrestrial radio, and you're listening to the. God help me as I say it, Triple J presenters interview, they're sort of going across and they're just talking about wishy-washy stuff. But I like to sort of get right behind it and allow people to understand exactly what's going on with the band. What I, what I, what I like to do is, because it, it, in my view, it enables people, it, it endears you more to people to want to support you. And you made a, if you're looking after the merch, I've got to give you big props because I was looking at the merch that was available, man, and that's great. That's The bundles that you've got <laughs> together are fantastic. Thanks, man. Well, um, to tell you the truth, 
those bundles that you're looking at and stuff, that's all um, that's all done by our label in the states, Eclipse. Um, so they're they're bundles that come from the states. So I can't take the um, the accolades for them, unfortunately. Um, but in in, in 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 Australia, you know, I've I've handled the merch before. We um, hmm. like like all bands, I suppose. We started out as full DIY, you know, like but we didn't want to just stick around playing shows in the garage, all that kind of stuff. So hmm. myself and um, Matthew or Cosy. Um, the guitarist, uh, he is one of the main driving forces in the band as well. Um, so we used to do a, like, cause we had a couple of member, member changes earlier on and stuff like that. So it was kind of a lot of just, uh, work from himself and my, and myself and, um, cause he's got, um, a big, like a long history with playing in bands locally and stuff like that. So he knows mm-hmm. a lot of people and he's very tenacious and, um, we kind of handled a lot of the – like everything ourselves basically until we got signed. You know what I mean? We, we, we had help from mates and stuff like that and the other band members obviously. But we did everything ourselves, him and myself. Yep. And, um, and then we got signed to Eclipse and all of a sudden we've got a record label that's doing all the promotions for us. You know, Whereas before that it was myself and Cozzy calling up CD Baby, getting our own sort of you know just mm-hmm. independent – independent distribution and um we now have this record label that's doing all of the promotion uh for uh, well not all of it obviously we promote ourselves as well but they um help us you know they're they're a big driving force now with a lot of the pillars that um are in the background of of, of making a band successful and fun you know so and it's mm-hmm. cool it means um it means cozy and myself can take a step back and just work on pr- promoting a, a show or um, you know, work on, you know, uh, you know what we're going to do next with the album and stuff like that, you know. So it's it's cool having other people working for us like that, you know. Yeah, sweet. And the bass playing side of things, because I, I play guitar and bass, but my primary stage instrument is the bass guitar. How do you find uh, playing the bass guitar and the sort of music that you're playing? So, for example, do you write some of the music on the bass and bring it to the guys or are you, are you writing it on the guitar? Or talk me through how that works just from your perspective. Yeah, man. So... Like my my whole thing with that side of thing is I am you know and it, but how do I say this without sounding harsh like mm-hmm. I'm traditionally not a bassist I'm a guitarist a mm-hmm. mediocre one at best um and and I'm I'm in the band be, well you know I helped start it with with Cosy and a few mates but I like there were already two guitarists in the band back then there was Cosy and our and our old friend Callum. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they, they needed to, um, or they, they wanted to get someone that could sing as well as, you know, play an instrument like a bass or something like that to mm-hmm. fill up a few spots. So I'm like, well, I can make the transition to bass. That's no dramas at all. But, um, I'm primarily, you know, a clean singer, like, like a melodic singer. Sure. Yep. And, um, yeah. So that, that was my sort of initial force to come into the band. And, um, so when it comes to writing music and stuff like that, Kerrod and Cozzy are the riff masters. They're just really, really good at it. So they make the song structures themselves on the guitar. And my job on the bass is really easy because I can just flow the bass line around their, you know, song structure that, that, that they've made. I've never had to um, or, like, I've never really been able to come up with a song by myself on bass to show them because I'm always more focused on the singing, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I get that. That's something that I've struggled with, and I was talking to Victoria from Fragile Animals up here about it. I I can play guitar and sing, I wouldn't even say well, I can get by, but Mm. it's so much bloody harder on the bass, especially when I'm playing fingerstyle bass and the the approach to the rhythm seems to be going counterclockwise when everybody else is going clockwise, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does, because you've got to keep a steady beat Whereas if you're singing and you're syncopating your, your like your voice, mm. you're going to want to flick your hands like in in, in the same sort of structure Spot as you have. Yeah, just get, you know to to a four four beat or something, you know. So mm. surprisingly, it is a lot harder to do that. And um, when I um, when I sing, you know, it took a bit of practice at first, you know, because you've got to just get used to what you're doing. So it's um you know like when like the songs we play live, you know, when when we practice it, it just becomes muscle memory, which yeah. is good. Because um, yeah, it's good. It's good that I've you know been able to hone that ability. You know, so there's a classic video on YouTube that I want you to check out after we've had our chat. It's by a band called Winger. Remember that band from the eighties? Winger, yeah. Winger, fantastic musicians. And Kip mm-hmm. Winger is the the vocalist, and he also plays bass. And there's a video. I don't know whether the track's called 
she's only 17 or she's 17. But I think if you type in winger 17 and live, they're on like a Letterman style show. Yeah. And Kip is playing and often he's holding onto the microphone and singing and not playing bass. And he'll go back to playing bass. That's yeah. quite funny to watch. So my take on that is that he's got the same struggles. Okay. And he's an excellent musician and producer, by the way. Mm. Um, he, a guy like that at his level, if he has those problems, it makes me feel pretty good about the problems that I experience with it. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> right. Like, it's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? You know, like yeah, yeah, yeah it is. It is, mate. What does the future hold for the band? Because you, this this is a pretty bloody good album. Secrets. It must be said, and it, you, you're playing a style of music. Now, this is the second time I've had this conversation with a band from Australia, but bands like Five Finger Death Punch and stuff like that. Papa Roach, mate, you could easily fit in a bill with those guys. So what are you looking to try to achieve in terms of touring and broaden your audience? Well, man, we um, – yeah, well, our, our idea uh, is definitely to get back to the States. The last last time we, we went over to the States for a massive tour, it was one of the best things we've ever done, and um, we can't wait to get back over there. The last tour, uh, we were – I think we were meant to be on one, actually, with Five Finger Death Punch, but we ended up um, going over with our mates – or our now mates, uh, Drowning Pool. Uh, cool. Was, yeah, was awesome. A, a few years ago now, but um, – yeah, we've um, we've stayed in contact with them and been friends with them now, which was, um, you know, which has just been sensational for us, you know. So they've always said, you know, whenever we go down to Texas, we can play shows with them and stay with them and stuff like that. So they're really hospitable, which is great. Um, and yeah, man, like Five Finger Death Punch, we'd love to be on a bill with them. They, you know, their music is friggin' awesome. So uh, that real sort of Southern American rock like you know hard rock and roll kind of thing you know, yeah it's, like it's, hell hell yeah god bless vinnie paul yeah, who just passed yeah. away of course but that sort of music has it's surprisingly uh what's the word resilient you know, you know what i'm saying it i yeah, feel like as right. though when when hell yeah started part of me sort of part of me went okay here we go uh metal or rock by numbers and that mm. was 2005 or six or something yeah and uh they're still going yeah, and, that's it, man. Like it's, it's insane when you think about it. Like their love for that sort of thing is just like it. It, it goes above all other you know senses for them. You know what I mean? Hmm. And that whole Vinnie Paul thing too, man. Like that, that's um that's a big hit to the community. You know, like that's 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 huge. That guy was a metal pioneer, a god. You know, like um in fact, it's um I want to do a special shout out to our friend Greg Rideout. He was our sound guy for the Drowning Pool tour, and he was good mates. He he was Hell Yeah's sound guy as well. So. He's, um, There's the connection, yeah. Yeah, he's connection. pretty. He's, he's he's not doing so good, you know. He's 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 posting up. He's pretty sad about it. So you know, doing a big shout out to Greg that we're thinking about him, man. Yeah, and well done to you for doing that, mate. Because Jamie Alls, Jamie Jaster, I should say, you know, Jamie Jaster from Hatebreed, who's also got his excellent podcast series, which has been a big inspiration for me and what I do with my podcasting and radio show. And I've interviewed a lot of the same people he has, but he's he's just so good at what he does. But yeah. He was talking to Billy Grazia Die from Biohazard. I listened. I, the episode probably came out a couple of weeks ago, but I listened to it on Sunday when I was mm. stuck in the traffic, getting trying to get past all the bloody crowd that's coming out of the Broncos game in the city. <laughs> <laughs> and he was talking about what what Vinny. He gave the detail on the podcast episode what Vinny had actually done for him. And it was really interesting to hear the doors that Vinny was helping open for a guy like Jamie, who's very well connected. I mean, the guy was the guy was uh, the host of Headbangers Ball on MTV for a couple of years there, so Jamie's mm. pretty well connected. But Vinny, being in Pantera and being as sociable and personable as what he is, loved to help people and wanted to do it for people as well, and had the connections to be able to help people in a, in a meaningful way. Sorry, is the way I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's so it. He's talking about how. On these, mod, you know, I know the states is a very big terrestrial radio. On the states is very different to what it is here. They've got dedicated stations for say rock and roll and hip hop and this sort of yeah. thing. And Vinny was helping him, and I don't want to misquote, but I think he was helping him open. He was helping Jamie put. He was helping Jamie by getting him giving him a foot in the door at some of these rock radio stations, so as a hate breed and the Jasta project could get some airplay. Mm. You know, and you think there's nothing in that for Vinny directly, except just the camaraderie of brothers in metal and rock and roll yeah that's it exactly like he's just doing it for the love of it you know what i mean mm. and it sucks because now he's not here anymore you know and yeah i guess that's just a fact of life that we have to always put up with i guess 
I'll, I'll tell you something. All of these great heroes of rock and metal that we're losing over the last... Uh, Dime was an aberration, of course, back in 2004. Mm. We're losing a lot of guys to so-called natural causes, if you like. Mm. Uh, I say so-called because I, I'm not. I'm not given. We're not given any more information about why people are passing away. In a lot of instances, like I haven't read about why Vinny passed away, except that he just passed away. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think it was. Um, I. I. I haven't heard like su- like all of the super details, but uh, I knew. I. I definitely know he. Um, he had some form of like like severe heart attack. Yeah, yeah. I, you'd think that something would there'd be a precursor to it, though. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, look, it's we're getting to a point. I was, you've got, I, you've got. To, I'm not a sentimental guy. I'll say that. I'm a father. I'm a husband. So I get sentimental, sentimental about my family, no doubt about that. But mm. I remember the first time I ever got sentimental about someone passing away in the general community outside of my family was when Lemmy passed away. Yeah, because yeah, I thought, yeah, Cause, I thought. It was he was just, going to live forever, man. He was going to live forever. He's Lemmy, you know? Yeah, remember that joke that was going around in the years prior to his death, which was, you know, what sort of a world are we going to leave for Keith Richards and Lemmy? Yeah. Uh, it's a bit, exactly. bit longer. The quote was a bit longer than that, but it was, we've, got to, we've got to, you know, clean up the environment because yeah. what sort of a world are we going to leave for Keith Richards and Lemmy? You know, it was, it was, That's right. Yeah. I mean, Keeth Richards eventually goes. It's like, well, you know, what's, like, who are we going to look to now? Like, we've got no, got no more hope, you know? Well, there's there's always um, Willie Nelson, Bob Dylan. There's those guys going around. I don't, I don't know how Willie Nelson is still around. Ozzy <laughs> Osbourne. Oh, I don't, I, Ozzy's another one. I I, uh, I was talking to. I was in a band called the Copycats, a covers band, and myself and Nathan got along famously. He was in Sakuth, that the metal band, and we were we were. It was about when who passed away? David Bowie, of course. David David and Lemmy passed away at about the same time. Yep. within a couple of months of each other. And we actually thought, God bless him for Keith staying with us, but Phil might be somewhere in the near horizon because I was looking at some videos of Phil and he looked grey. He just he looked bloated. He looked like as though he was living very, very hard. And um, what I have noticed is that if you haven't given up your hard living lifestyle, I call it the Peter Pan syndrome with all due respect to everybody, but there comes a point where you simply can't drink every day or even every second day or possibly even every week if you haven't got a sort of the constitution that can handle it. If the great, the great Lemmy really, I mean, he lived a great life. He lived five lifetimes over. So I'm sure wherever he is in the, beyond the great ether, he regrets absolutely nothing. Um, but I guess in someone like my position, because I've got kids and the like, you really do start to think about these sort of things about the way you treat your body. I know for a fact I can't drink anywhere near as much as what I did. I'm 40 now, but when I was, say, 35. Yep. That's only five years ago. I uh, completely know where you're coming from. I'm 33. And uh, sometimes, you know, you, you, you're not 23 anymore. You're 33, you know, and it's like all of a sudden you can't drink like two bottles of rum in a weekend and then go to work on Monday fresh as a daisy, you know. It starts catching up to you. Um, yeah. And these, um, like when you're on tour, like for months on end, and the booze is free every single day, you know. Like it's, it sounds amazing, and don't get me wrong, it is. But after <laughs> a while, it definitely takes its toll on you. You know what I mean? And 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 you gotta, you gotta then look and discipline yourself to, um, you know, just sort of stay off it for a while and look to uh, get healthy and stuff like that, and focus on the healthy things and stuff like that. Otherwise, like you said, you're just gonna work yourself into the ground and mm. and end up and end up dead at forty or fifty or something, you know. And you don't want that. So, or, or you could do what those select few do, like like uh, Keith Richards and um, Ozzy Osbourne, and just do so much drugs that your body just pickles into a state, and you'll just you know become like this living mummy and just never die. Yeah, Ozzy does has started to look his age now, though. I'm sure he's pushing seventy or near about. Um, yeah. I was looking at some photos of him the other day, or there was a video posted online, and he was doing some cameo thing and. He actually does look pretty – he's getting there. He's sort of getting to the point now where even if Sharon really wants to push him out in a wheelchair, I don't think he, he could do it. And, <laughs> you know, and I, I saw them – I'm a big Ozzy Osbourne fan. I'll go on record and say that now. But I, old school, like I'm in, one of the first bands I ever got into and I had the – I really enjoyed having a chat to Zach about this because I think one of the first records I ever got was No Rest for the Wicked back in yeah. – but I got it in about 1989 or 1990, a year or two out of, after it came out, but it was one of the first albums that I got into. Yep. Um, 
And I saw Ozzy in 1998 when he toured with the No More Tears band. And they were brilliant. They were fantastic. And I saw him again when he played the Entertainment Centre of Boondle with... Um, he had a different band. He had Mike Borden from Faith No More, phenomenal drummer, great drummer. Yep. Who do you have on guitar? He had Zach on guitar. I don't think Zach had his best night that night, to be honest. It just it didn't seem the energy wasn't there. And, of course, Blasco was the bass player. So the former Rob Zombie, and he's also bass player and also the producer and... Um, manager who looks after uh, a lot of different uh, metalcore bands I think over there in the States but Ozzy sounded terrible that night he was a full half a beat not just a tenth of a beat a half a beat behind everybody else when he was singing yeah and I thought at that time I was actually I actually thought that he was going to get really bad reviews but the crowd didn't give a shit the crowd were jumping up and down in all of the obvious spots and the songs that I don't really care for anymore because I'd they're sort of the ones of the popular sphere, like Paranoid. Mm. I think for some people too, the um, seeing him like that is a spectacle. You know what I mean? Like they kind of expect it. It's almost like he's become a parody of himself in some sort of embarrassing way, which sounds terrible. Mm. But um, y- 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 you know what I mean? Like he's. He, I do. Like, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. He was off beat. Like you know, last time I saw him, he was pretty good actually. But you know, if 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 he was off beat by half a beat all the time. It'd kind of be like, oh, you know, ah, oh, Ozzy, you, you cheeky little devil. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you, you're almost yeah. laughing with him, you know? Well, I, I think there was a few cuts, a few old school cuts that he did, such as Bark at the Moon, the, the title track to the 1984 album, I think it was. Yep. Jakey Lee's guitar playing, I love that. And the band had to slow down so that he could catch up. And I'm sure that happened. I wasn't imagining things. I'm a musician, as I've explained, so I picked these things up. But it it didn't even, it almost, it still sounded like the song, but it sounded like a band. You know those moments when you all learn a song? If you play covers, you'll know what I'm talking about. You all learn a song at home and you come into a rehearsal room and you play it for the very first time mm-hmm. and you're still feeling your way through it, but it's a more complicated song like a Van Morrison song because I do a lot of pop and rock covers yep. around town. And those numbers are the ones where you really they, – they sounded like that. You're slow and somebody speeds up somewhere and the drummer forgets the feel and I might forget that a chorus goes into a verse and this part of there's a turnaround here or something. I'm not saying they made a mistake, but it almost sounded like they were about to because of the way that Oz was singing. But I guess the, the overall point is that I thought, he was, I thought he was cactus back then, but here we are 10 years later and he's touring, I wouldn't say nonstop, but he's, he's out there bloody a lot. He's not slowing down. He's no. not slowing down at all. And, man, I saw him a couple of years ago. I didn't catch him on his last run, but I saw him uh, when Black Sabbath came out. And he was killer. He was unreal. He, it's, you know, I guess getting clean and getting off the booze definitely helps with that. He's not mm. so delusional. But, um, man, he nailed it. Like, you know, he wasn't jumping around the stage like Bruce Dickinson or anything, but that's <laughs> not really Aussie's style anyway. You know what I mean? Like, he, he was really good. And, uh, yeah, it's surprising. Um, but yeah, so, I uh, I did so my own cool. personal boycott of that song because I like Bill Ward, but you know, <laughs> so yeah. I, I, uh, I I heard a lot of mates, a few mates who are mad Black Sabbath fans, and I'm one of those very very rare animals that prefers Dio fronted Black Sabbath to Aussie fronted Black Sabbath, and I love Ozzy Osbourne by himself and his solo material. By Ooh. the way, I just love those two or three albums. Sorry that. Well, four really, if you count the Heaven and Hell thing that was released in 2005 or six with Dio fronting it. I think Dio's voice just really suited what the guitar playing, the guitar playing that Tommy, Tony produces. Yeah, and you know what? Stupidly, I've only heard that a couple of times. I've really got to give that another chance, actually. You've just reminded me. Thank you. As a muso, I think you could potentially form the same opinions that I have. Yeah, yeah. Because, man, like Dio is one of my favorite singers. Like Ozzy Osbourne isn't. I don't know. He's definitely an entertainer, and I yeah. love him. But he's—I you know, don't—I don't really look up to him as a singer. You know what I mean? Whereas um, Dio, I definitely do. Yeah, think... Dio was a loss. There's another one. God, there's another yeah. one that's no longer with us. Yeah, hasn't he exactly. left a legacy? That's it. He, but he's—you know—he's he's the, he's the prince of darkness, man. He had to—he had to <laughs> descend to his throne at some point. <laughs> descend to his throne, he did indeed. May, <laughs> may the the dark lord rest in peace. Yeah. That's uh, right. Exactly. Yeah, I, I didn't. I got into him posthumously. It must be said. I loved his Black Sabbath stuff, but his solo material I've ended up getting into after the fact. Uh, love Vivian Campbell's guitar playing and Craig Goldie's guitar playing on a lot of that '80s stuff. Uh, he's he's another guy who could pick his musicians very very well. Mm-hmm. No, I agree, hundred mm. percent. 
Mate, what else? What else do we need to talk about with the band in terms of getting getting this out there for you? So you've got a show coming up with uh, you've got a show coming up at Crowbar, which for those people who don't know is the Fortitude in the Fortitude Valley Entertainment Precinct here in Brisbane. That's right. Okay. Have you got a new album potentially in the pipeline? Because to your point earlier in the conversation, you've probably come to the end of the promotion of the album cycle of Secrets. Yeah, exactly. We. Um... We definitely do have a new album in the cycle. We are, uh, I guess you could say, about halfway through writing it. The, we've got about 10, 11 songs written uh, mu- musically. Um, we'll probably change them a million times before it's finished, but we've got, we've got them there. And uh, we're just sort of in the process of putting the lyrics and the, and, and the, and the singing to them at the moment. Mm. So we're quite sound. Well, we certainly haven't just started. We've, we've, we've been working on it for a few months now. And, um, yeah, hopefully we, uh, we should be recording by the end of the year. Is it going to be a continuation of what you've produced here on Secrets or have you added some new stuff? We have, I guess you could say for the new album, we've gone back to our roots a bit more on our, um, from our first record, musically. Uh, the, um, like our last album, Secrets, was uh, very lyrically based and very uh, singing based, you know, because we wanted to showcase Reese's new mm. uh, style of screaming and uh, my singing on it and stuff. P- pardon me. And um, on the new album that we're writing, it's, I guess you could say, it's, it's a lot more riff based, you know, like Cozzy and Carrot have come up with some really awesome, punchy, rocking riffs. So we're we're taking a few of the songs right back to our first album where we're, you know, making these songs sort of focus around the riffs inside them rather than on the lyrics and stuff like that. So not not to say that we're not putting, you know, our heart and soul into the lyrics as well. We're just sort of bringing up the music a bit more. So, And obviously, uh, like, we try and challenge ourselves with every album. You know, we try and uh, make a few songs that are even heavier again, like our heaviest yet kind of thing. Uh, We're trying to create a few more uh, ballads, where Reese and I can sing, uh, you know, like sort of bring it back a pace, you know. So we've got a few of those songs in the works as well. So, yeah, we uh, there should be a bit more diversity on this one. Sorry, not more diversity, just as much diversity as the other ones. You know, we like to yeah, sure. mix it a bit with a few songs, you know. Like on our last album, Secrets, um, a lot of the songs are of, of a similar style. And then, you know, we had that weekend cover that we did and then at the end we had the song sugar and spice which is like an 80s piss take like steel panther just because we want (laughs) to have a bit of fun you know so there'll be shit like that on the new album too where we mix it up a bit so yeah we you know it's it's going to be it's an interesting process you know it's really creative and um it's it's cool because you're creating something new so it's fun and it's a yeah it's you know butt heads and stuff like that with other bandmates and everything but (laughs) the end result's going to be awesome you know so that's what we look for have you thought about a producer at this point, or are you even going to get a producer, or are you going to do it yourselves? So we've, our last three albums, we've got Frederick Nordstrom to do it. Uh, we've flown him and his uh, sound engineer, Hanky, uh, no, Henrik, uh, over from Sweden uh, each time, which has been fantastic, you know, cool holiday and hang out with our now mates and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, this time around, our guitarist, Kerrod, uh, has really uh, it progressed with his knowledge of uh, Pro Tools and sound engineering and stuff like that, so and, mm-hmm. and recording techniques and stuff. So we're going to give recording it ourselves, a sh- like a red hot shot, and then mix it ourselves because Kerrod is amazing at doing that sort of thing, and just see what it sounds like. And then yep. we're going to get it sent off somewhere else to uh, get mastered. And man, if we're happy with that sound, that's what we're going for. If it sounds like shit, then we'll, you know, we're, we've got the humility within ourselves to then go and, and shop it around somewhere and get it mixed properly. There's a, I love doing this. Okay? I always like looking at musical partnerships, whether it be touring, uh, even musicians, but I do like pairing producers, uh, even engineers that I know about, just, you know, that, that are internationally recognized and the like. Now, there's an album that came out last year by a band called Amua. Have you heard of them? Muir, yeah. Okay, so, some people haven't, sorry, that's why I, I frame it that way. But yep. that album was one of my albums of the year last year. And one of the reasons for that, A, Josh Travis's guitar playing was all time on it. Mm. Just a phenomenal guitarist. The mm-hmm. rhythms and beats that he managed to come up with on that were just, uh, I loved, I'd love to interview him, but it's one of those things. I tried to interview him when he came out here, but I just got it when he came out here last year with um, The Artist Murder, but I got him too late, sorry. Anyway, I digress. But that oh, sure. album. 
look at yourself. The album that they produced or they released last year was produced by a guy called Drew Falk. Mm. Now, I had a conversation with Steve Tucker, and I know this band is very different to you guys, but Morbid Angel. Oh, yeah. Okay, I didn't feel that, and I was I was pretty brave in my conversation with Steve Tucker because I'm an old school Morbid Angel fan, and I I basically said I don't think they got it quite right with the production, and some of the sounds on that album there, and I thought Drew would be a good match. Now I think your production, by the way, is excellent, uh, the one that Fredericks produced here on uh, Secrets. But have a listen to the album "Look at Yourself" by Muir with headphones on. And you'll hear what I'm talking about, about the sounds that Drew has pulled out of that band. And then you go back and you listen to some of the older Amur albums and it's a completely different sonic beast. Yeah. It feels like as though some of these genius producers can put a lot of space between all of the instrumentation, but it still sounds very full. I, I don't sure. know how they do it. I'm not sure how they do it. I, it must be, there's, there's a dark, there's an alchemy to it. I get that. But Drew is a guy, he's also worked with... Um, Who's he worked with? Motionless in White and Bullet for My Valentine to give you an idea. Yeah. About who he's worked with. So just just Google it and then check out just you know, if you you know, when you're going to before you go to bed tonight or what have you, I'm not saying definitely go and make it a mission or anything like that, but but oh, check- I want to hear it because I um I haven't heard it before. like I haven't heard their their latest stuff. I kind of drifted away from them a few years ago, so it's, I'll have to check it out. it's massive, mate. I, I had a chat to Frankie last year. And yeah. Frankie's basically like Chuck Schuldina or from Death or Dave Mustaine from Megadeth these days, and that he's got the ability to draw really good musicians to him. Um, and I just hope that the lineup that he's got now stays together because I think they could become an absolute colossus if they can pull it off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they've had a few um, hiccups over the years, but yeah, man. Look, like I said, I you know that's, that's another band that sort of I just faded away from a couple of years ago and. Um, I'm going to have to check out the new album. You reminded me of them again, so thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good, all good. So, mate, I think that just about covers it. Is there is there anything else that you want to share with the audience about the band? Um, um, so, not uh, no. I guess we've covered everything really. So we, you know, we we started back in 2009. We're we're still kicking along now. We're about to create our fourth album. Uh, hopefully, we should be recording it by the end of the year, and uh, hopefully. 2019 uh, will be a very busy year for us. So. Yeah. Good luck to you. Deserve to be. I love when I see bands, local bands, to me at least, uh, local bands in the south southeast of Queensland going forth and prospering and conquering, mate. And the fact that you've got off your asses and you've been willing and been brave enough to ask a guy like Frederick to come out, but three albums, mate. I mean, he's a goddamn legend. Yeah. Three albums down with him, mate. I mean, you guys are on the cusp of something pretty significant. If you're able to attract that caliber of individual into your fold, yeah, no, thanks a lot for that, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, we we uh, we love doing it. We love doing it. So why not do it proper? You know what I mean? Like, there's no point uh, not doing it 100. percent Otherwise, you're just doing yourself an injustice. That's the way we look at it. So, mm. yeah, indeed, indeed, mate. That's it. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast. My name's Andrew Mackay Smith, and that was a conversation that featured a fellow by the name of Blair Late. Blair is a member of Brisbane's A Breach of Silence. Thank you so much for listening.